Hi everyone! Up until now, we have discussed the crystals and how they form, crystallographic coordinates and crystal defects. In the last video of the structural properties of the materials, we will be focusing on the powder excited fraction. While doing so, we will mention electromagnetic radiation and spectrum, and X-ray diffraction theory and the method. Let's start. Electric and magnetic disturbance traveling through space at the speed of light is called the electromagnetic radiation. EM radiation does not have a mass or charge, but travels in the form of photons. Different types of EM radiation are shown on a spectrum called EM spectrum, where they are sorted in an ascending order of frequency in Hertz, and in descending order of the wavelengths corresponding to those frequencies in meters. Our eyes can detect the visible light region of EM spectrum, which falls between 380 nanometers to 800 nanometers. Any EM radiation with lower or higher wavelength is invisible to naked human eye, but they can be detected through different tools and used for different applications. Uh, no, I'm not talking about these tools, hmm. okay, I guess I need to talk more about these tools and applications. For instance, we can detect IR through the warmth we feel through our skin, or our TV and radio antennas can collect radio waves and convert them into sound waves or motion pictures. Microwaves can be used for heating food and UV is employed by dentists for disinfecting the tools and curing the composite fillings. Gamma rays are used for radiotherapy. Lastly, we have X-ray radiation, which is widely used by materials characterization and for medical imaging applications. X-ray beams are produced using X-ray tubes. High voltage is applied to the X-ray tubes for accelerating the electrons released from the cathode and make them hit the metal targets at the anode. As a result of this interaction, an X-ray beam is produced. Most of the time, copper is used as the metal anode for the powder X-ray diffraction. Utilization of the right tools for characterization studies is of significant importance. Thus, you must choose the portion of the EM spectrum that would properly interact with the features of your specimen. As a rule of thumb, the wavelength of the employed EM radiation must be smaller than or equal to the dimensions of interest. When talking about powder XRD, we are talking about below nanometer dimensions, which falls into the X-ray region of the EM spectrum. The powder X-ray diffraction is a non-destructive characterization technique used for the structural analysis of the materials. Through this technique, we can analyze the present phases and their percent distribution, crystal structures, lattice parameters, microstrains, positions of the atoms in the unit cell, the average crystallite size, and preferred grain orientations of our specimen. These are just some of the commonly calculated structural properties. Please leave a comment below if you are using X-rays for applications other than powder XRD. Before moving further with powder XRD, let's talk a little bit about the diffraction mechanism and the math behind it. The X-ray beam leaving the X-ray tube, also known as primary beam, will be monochromatic, meaning that it will have a single wavelength, that is 1.54056 angstrom for copper K alpha radiation. The X-rays in the primary beam will be in phase. However, after the diffraction, there will be some phase shift occurring between the diffracted beams, also known as secondary beams. Depending on the magnitude of these phase shifts, constructive or destructive interference can be observed. When a monochromatic X-ray beam is sent to the sample, the path difference between atomic layer 1 and 2 will be AB plus BC. For an arbitrary phase shift, some of the waves under these layers will destroy each other. The only condition satisfying the complete constructive interference between diffracted beams is the case where the phase shift is an integer multiple of the wavelength, meaning that the AB plus BC is equal to 2D sine theta. This correlation was theorized in Bragg's law 
and represented as n lambda equal to 2d sin theta. Here, n stands for an integer, lambda for the wavelength of the incoming X-ray beam, theta for the angle between the diffraction plane and the incoming beam, which is equal to the angle between the diffraction plane and the diffracted beam, and d for the interplanar spacing, which is equal to the distance between two layers of a selected crystal plane. Interplanar spacing is calculated using the equation listed for your specimen's crystal structure in this table. We will be also sharing a link in the description for you to download this list. During powder XRD testing, the primary beam scans the specimen between the operator defined initial and final angle values at a constant scan rate. The diffracted beam is collected by the detector located in the mirror symmetry of the X-ray tube and moves together with it, but in the opposite direction. The diffracted beam may hit the detector or not, depending on the crystal plane of diffraction. Diffraction peaks will be observed only for the crystal planes diffracting the beam successfully towards the detector. Now, let's imagine an ideal scenario where we have an infinitely long single crystal titanium dioxide crystal having anatase phase, which was grown over the 101 plane, meaning that the crystal was grown in 010 direction. Lastly, let's assume that the X-ray diffractometer introduces no systematic errors to the data. In such a scenario, we would see a single peak at the 2 theta angle corresponding to the 101 plane of the anatase crystal. However, as the level of intensity of these assumptions signal, this scenario is quite far from reality. So, let's take a few steps forward towards reality, and assume that we have an ideal polycrystal anatase, and our X-ray diffractometer still doesn't introduce any systematic errors to our data. In such a case, our data would look like this. Here we see diffraction peaks of more crystal planes in the dataset. A crystal plane can form a diffraction peak if and only if the beams do not have destructive interference in between and hit the detector. In that case, we see a peak for that crystal plane at the corresponding 2 theta angle in our diffractogram. Although for the second case we are more down to earth, we are still far from real cases due to the ideal polycrystal and systematic error-free diffractometer assumptions. In reality, neither of them exists. During the experiments, data deviates from the ideal conditions as a result of the systematic errors introduced by the diffractogram, and the crystal defects such as grain boundaries, vacancies, impurities, etc. in the material. You may check video 1.3 for more details on the crystal defects. The deviation from ideality reflects to the collected data as a noteworthy background noise, decrease in signal-to-noise ratio, and as the broadening of the peaks. Although the background noise and the lowered signal-to-noise ratio provides no additional information about our specimen and have negative impact on our data quality, luckily, peak broadening can provide us a rough but useful information about the crystallite sizes, so long as they are smaller than 120 nanometers. Scherer's equation is used for the calculations of the average crystallite size. Yet, before moving forward, we would like to suggest the utilization of Scherer's equation for qualitative comparison of crystallite sizes, instead of the quantitative comparison. Now, let's go back to Scherer's equation, which is tau equals to k lambda divided by beta cos theta. Here, tau is the average crystallite size in nanometer, k is a dimensionless shape factor typically taken as 0.9, lambda is the wavelength of the X-ray beam which is equal to 1.54056 angstrom for copper k alpha radiation. Theta is the half of the 2 theta degree corresponding to the top of that peak. And lastly, beta is the radian equivalent of the line broadening at the half maximum of the peak after removal of the instrumental broadening and the background noise. Before we wrap up this video, there is one more thing left to mention, that is, shifting of the peaks. 
Peaks may shift due to the distortion of the lattices as a result of introduction of crystal defects such as vacancies and interstitials, or by changing the X-ray source. Let's start with the lattice distortion under an X-ray beam with known wavelength. As the lattice expands, the lattice parameters will increase, leading to an increase in interplanar spacing of the selected crystal plane. As Bragg's law suggests, increasing interplanar spacing will proportionally decrease the sine theta value, which will reflect the diffractogram by shifting the peak towards smaller two theta values. Or, if the lattice shrinks, then the lattice parameters will decrease and lead to a decrease in the interplanar spacing of the selected plane. Lower interplanar spacing will lead to an increase in sine theta, shifting the corresponding peak to the higher two theta values. Let's move on to the other case, which leads to the shifting of peaks. If the peaks of your material are cramped in any region in your data, you may try shifting the peaks by changing the wavelength of the X-ray beam via changing the X-ray tube. As an X-ray with smaller wavelength is employed, according to the Bragg's law, sine theta will decrease, and shifting the peaks to lower two theta values. Or, if an X-ray having higher wavelength is used, then the corresponding sine theta value will increase and shift the peaks towards higher two theta values. Such modifications may positively affect your data distribution and the peak resolution. With this said, we have reached the end of this video and the end of the structural properties of materials videos. In the upcoming videos, we will be covering the mechanical properties of the materials. In the next video, we will be covering the tensile testing, stress strain curves, and their data interpretation. Until next time,